Welcome back, everybody, to another reaction video. Well, we are going to revisit Salmonella Academy again today, and keeping with our theme of uh, World War II naval history, we're going to finally take a look at the World War II's unluckiest ship, the William D. Porter. I know a little bit about this. I know it had some crazy mishaps, including almost killing the President of the United States, or at least risking his life in a significant way. But uh, I'm not going to get too far ahead of myself. We'll just let the video speak for itself. I'll try to fill in some things, make some observations. We'll look up a little more information if it's warranted. As always, check out the original content. The link's in the description below. I'm recording several videos today, as tonight I am off uh, to Arlington National Cemetery and Gettysburg for the weekend. So lots of content coming your way. Let's dive in. This video is sponsored by Skillshare. <laughs> Hey kids, now some philosophers have called boats the airplanes of the sea, but while every glamorous Glennis has its slow-mo shun, so too does JJ the Jetplane have his awful, awful counterpart. Her legacy in many ways resembles my middle school career, a three-year-long travesty plagued by blunder after blunder oh due gosh. to both gross incompetence and sheer misfortune, with the only silver lining being that it's remembered by relatively few. Meet the USS William D. Porter, nicknamed the Willie D., which was a perfectly acceptable alias in the days before Don't Ask, Don't Tell. She was a Fletcher-class destroyer, which, if you know Fletcher as well as I do, you know he's pretty high-class at destroying. Like when he snapped off my DS screen during summer camp because he was trying to get a better look. Didn't he? Uh, the Fletcher-class destroyers are kind of some of the most state-of-the-art destroyers at the time in World War II. They are really some of the workhorses of the U.S. Navy. They do a lot. Uh, you know, it's always glamorous to talk about aircraft carriers and battleships because they're the big capital ships. They're the big, you know, ones with thousands of people on board. But it's these destroyers that really make a difference, especially when it comes to the Atlantic theater uh, and dealing with anti-submarine warfare, uh, things like that. I believe the uh, latest film uh, with Tom Hanks uh, that's over, I think, on Apple TV uh, concerns a captain of a Fletcher class destroyer. So, uh, fascinating stuff. We'll probably take a look some more of it at some point. Didn't even apologize. He was just like, well, you're not supposed to bring video games to camp anyway, even though everyone did. Fuck you, Fletcher. You were a counselor. You're supposed to be more mature than us. You're the reason I grew up with a lingering resentment towards authority. And my only reprisal is that I got to draw you as a disgusting fat lard. So I got to just make an observation here. This is a seven minute video. We're over a minute in and we really haven't talked much about the Fletcher class destroyer William D. Porter so far but I get it he's comedy for millions of people Actually, I think his name would have been Eric. Anyway, in July of 1943, the ship was commissioned by the Navy and led by Lieutenant Commander Wilfred A. Walter. As her first real job, the Willie D. was assigned to a top-secret escort mission across the Atlantic. Walter was like, alright man, time to prove ourselves. I want to see you all on your A-game. And as its first act under military command, the ship didn't raise anchor properly and tore a massive chunk out of the ship next to it while pulling out. Okay, rough start, but definitely not a sign of things to come. The next day, she met up with three other ships, including two destroyers and a battleship known as the USS Iowa and the fleet set off towards Africa given the clandestine nature of the op so it's it's escorting I mean the Iowa has President Roosevelt on board they're taking him I believe to the Tehran conference uh, where he's gonna be meeting with Stalin and Churchill and <laughs> I don't know if the men on board knew that or not um, in fact I'm kind of curious about that so let's take a look Okay, so it looks like it. while it was a top secret mission, I think the guys on the porter were aware that Roosevelt was on board the Iowa. Um, by the way, they made about 175 of these ships, the Fletcher class destroyers. They had a little over 300 officers and men on board, um, had a top speed of like 37 knots. So, you know, you can see why these were so versatile uh, and why they made such a difference in the war. Operation. They were ordered to maintain total radio silence so as not to alert any subs that might be lurking below. I know Suddenly, it's boom, bang, borf, Hare Krishna, huge explosion off the starboard quarter. They're like, holy shit, evasive maneuvers. 
No. But after however many minutes, the transmission comes in saying, Uh, hi, this is Wolfred D of the Willy Walter. I mean, uh, so a depth charge may have accidentally fallen off the ship, and we may have also forgotten to turn off the safety mechanisms on said charge, causing it to detonate immediately. So, if you heard a little noise a bit ago, no cause for alarm. I'll so... This ship, I mean, at what point do you say, okay, maybe it's time for a new captain? Um, you know, this lieutenant commander might not be the guy. They, you know, have the mishap with the anchor. Now they drop a depth charge. And it would be wonderful to say that that was the worst thing that happened, but the torpedo incident's coming. I know it's coming, and this one just blows my mind, the stupidity. Also, sorry for breaking radio silence. Love you. Bye. Shortly thereafter, a strange phenomenon was spotted near the ship. Officer, what in the rhyme of the ancient fuck is that? Appears to be a large wave, sir. Jesus Christ, they have that now? <coughs> Basically everything that wasn't tied down ended up being swept off, and one of the boilers in the engine room got foobarred. But fortunately, no crew members were taken away. Except for the one that was. Later, the four ships congregated in the water's east- Wait, wait, did they lose a crew member during the wave thing? I didn't know about this. Okay, I can't find anything about this wave washing a, a sailor overboard. I do know that the commanding officer of the porter eventually became an admiral, so this did not deter his career at all. East of Bermuda, when the Iowa decided to test its anti-air abilities and launched a bunch of weather balloons for target practice. A few of these drifted towards the Willie D, and they took some pot shots just for fun, probably wrecking some happy albatross households in the process. But Walter was like, men, it's time to redeem ourselves. Spit those crayons out. Don't you know the purple ones are bad for you? Time for some impromptu torpedo drills on the Iowa. Yay! <sighs> That was Narnar and the Pow Pow. They're going to douse their trousers when they see how good we tore those pedos. Say, you guys remember... Now, he makes it sound like this was something that the porter came up with completely on their own. But this was actually a planned drill where they were going to demonstrate a uh, kind of a, a torpedo attack on the Iowa. But they weren't supposed to actually fire a live torpedo at the Iowa, which is what they do. Remember to uh, take the primer out of all of them before launching, right? Yes, sir. Yep. What? Fortunately, the Iowa didn't really have much valuable cargo that could be damaged in the event the that the torpedo struck. Oh, except for 32nd President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was being escorted to Cairo as the whole point of the mission. The next five minutes aboard the Willie D were just total fucking chaos. Humid sacks of rice, hogs and bats sniffing each other, massive stereos. Commander, we really uh, So that's a reference to the, uh, the line from... Ghostbusters, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria, you know, like, you know, they're talking about what's going to happen at the end of the world, that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, they, they've they got radio silence, and so they're, they're trying to figure out what to do. We just launched a live torpedo at the one of our state-of-the-art battleships carrying the President of the United States, but we can't just get on the radio and tell them. So they start using signals, but instead of using the signal, uh, the the um, lantern signal that tells them, hey, we just launched a live torpedo at you, they end up telling them something completely different, like, hey, we're turning or something like that. Should radio then? No, I am not breaking any more rules. Do the flashy light thing. Hey, incoming signal from old iron brains, a uh, yuck. They're saying they're uh, going to reverse at full speed? What? Shit off a bow sprint, this ain't working! Fine, call him! FaceTime, Uvo, I don't give a hoot! The transmission arrived in the nick of time, and the torpedo detonated a safe distance away in the Iowa's wake. Of course, that didn't stop the entire crew of the Willie D from being arrested for, you know, shooting a torpedo at the president. Lawton Dawson, the Elmer's eater from earlier, was initially sentenced to 14 years hard labor. So it's the, uh, the, the, the officer in command of the torpedoes <laughs> that is, uh, the one who is, um, charged with this and it, they actually don't go after the commander for it at all he wasn't relieved of command or anything like that um roosevelt actually intervenes on behalf of the crew and basically says hey it was an accident nobody got hurt let it go until fdr came out and was like no no it's okay boys will be boys but we are sending you and the rest of carnival cruise line to alaska where there's fewer things to ruin by being yep, yourself the illusions it, carnival cruise line because you're the worst and also clowns so they kicked it <laughs> for a while in the illusions otherwise known as the tale of the pregnant rat that makes up alaska this went on mostly without incident except wait i'm never gonna be able to unsee that now the tale 
of the pregnant rat that makes up Alaska. And also clowns. So they kicked it. And I've, I've been over here. Bethel, Alaska is like about the furthest I've ever traveled in my life. And it's over in this area. Uh, three hours of sunlight. It was crazy. It was it was really amazing, though, but everything's crazy expensive. Like a pizza was $27. Um, I got a six-inch sub at Subway, and it was like $20. It was crazy because they have to fly everything in. For a while in the Aleutians, otherwise known as the tale of the pregnant rat that makes up Alaska. This went on mostly without incident, except for when they were anchored outside an officer's home during a New Year's Eve party, and a sailor got drunk and decided to fire off one of the five-inch guns for a laugh, and ended up sending a bunch of his geranium straight to hell where they belong. Other than that, smooth sailing. Then they hung out at the Philippines for a bit before Central Command was like, alright, looks like you smooth skins are ready for actual missions again. So, any one of these things... I would think would have caused the removal of some sig significant people, but all of them together on one ship is just ridiculous to me. Except you, you're going to clown college. And the Willy D was sent to the Battle of Okinawa under the leadership of some guy named Charles. Here they actually did some worthwhile... Wait, why did they show a picture of Erasmus Keys who was a Union general during the war? Oh, no relation to the Charles M. Keys mentioned, so just a random picture of a Union general that's not even related to him. Okay of some guy named Charles. Here they actually did some worthwhile stuff until June 10th, 1945, when kamikaze. kamikaze began to dive towards them. They weren't able to shoot it down, probably because it wasn't American, but it crashed in the water some ways away. They were like, phew, crisis averted. Turned their attention elsewhere, unintentionally driving right over where the bomber landed. The plane was like, the hell? Oh, shit, that's right. <coughs> uh, Bonsai. <laughs> About Dang. three hours of desperate repairs went by before the order to abandon ship was given, and miraculously, every crew member made it out alive by the time the ship sank, just 12 minutes later. So it just goes to show, everything has its silver lining. Everyone on the dipship gets to live, every filthy Chuck E. Cheese ball pit has a delicious prize at the bottom, and the vast nexus of pointless diversions we call the internet actually has a couple productive things to do on it too. Sponsor time! Alright, so... Let's talk a little bit about kamikaze attacks. I want to try and offer something worthwhile out of all of this mess, okay? Before we do that, though, let's talk a little bit about what happened here at the end. So, yeah, it's a it's a Val dive bomber uh, that crashes uh, near near the ship. The ship uh, goes over top. It says the Val exploded, and it lifted the porter right out of the water. Um, she lost power broke and suffered broken steam lines. A number of fires broke out. For three hours, her crew struggled to put out the fires, repair the damage, and keep the ship afloat. Their efforts were in vain, and 12 minutes after the order to abandon ship went out, the, uh, the porter heeled over to starboard and sank by the stern. Miraculously, her crew suffered no fatal injuries. The warship's name was struck from the naval regist uh, vessel register on 11th July. So here's the porter. Um, they actually didn't even, it doesn't even look like they needed to use lifeboats. They were able to pull another ship uh, right up alongside. It looks like a smaller um, destroyer uh, and, and unload everybody from it there. Uh, oh, it's a landing craft, uh, L LCS, uh, that they're pulling up to, uh, to get them from. So let's talk about the effectiveness of kamikazes. Um, 2,525 kamikaze pilots. So if you're not familiar, kamikaze is, um, it, I believe it means divine wind. Uh, and it was basically, it was a suicide attack. It was a, a pilot, Japanese pilot would um, would fly a, a plane that was basically a flying bomb uh, and then just crash it into uh, a U.S. Navy ship. Um, although causing some of the heaviest casualties on U.S. carriers in 1945, the Japanese Navy sacrificed 2,522 kamikaze pilots uh, and the Japanese Air Force another 1,387. So we're talking almost 4,000 pilots, uh, far more than it had lost in 1942 when it sank or crippled three carriers. Uh, so um, the 2,800 uh, kamikaze attackers that... Uh, I guess that were successful in hitting something sank 34 navy ships damaged 368 others killed 4900 sailors so they actually killed more than they lost uh, and wounded 4800 despite radar detection and queuing airborne interception attrition and massive anti-aircraft barrages 14 percent of kamikaze survived to score a hit on a ship so only 14 percent um Nearly 8.5% of all ships hit by kamikazes actually sank. 
So they sank three escort carriers, the St. Low, the Omni Bay, and the Bismarck Sea. 14 destroyers, including the last ship to be sunk, the USS Callahan, on July 29, 1945. So right near the end of the war. Three high-speed transports, five landing ships, a uh, tank, uh, so those are LSTs, uh, four uh, LSMs. Uh, three LSM rocket ships, one auxiliary tanker, three victory ships, three liberty ships. So these are like um, cargo ships. Um, two high-speed minesweepers, one AUK class minesweeper, a submarine chaser, two PT boats. Why would you even fly a kamikaze plane into a PT boat? It seems kind of a waste. Uh, and two L uh, LCSs, landing craft supports. Uh, and so you, know, you can see later on they had these rocket-powered kamikaze planes it would be even harder to hit so gives you a little bit more background into the kamikazes and uh you know there's a lot of photographs of damage caused uh by kamikazes here's the horizontal stabilizer from a judy uh, on a deck uh, here's the saint low as it's being attacked by kamikazes took significant damage uh, hundreds were killed on the saint low um, the bunker hill here which uh 389 personnel dead and 264 wounded on the bunker hill from the damage that was caused so you know pretty significant um but you know there's a little bit more background into one of the craziest stories of world war ii the william d porter uh we'll see you more for uh, some more content that i'll be filming today that you'll see in the coming days and then start watching uh, for the last couple of episodes of our vicksburg series and then a bunch of other uh original content coming your way thanks for watching